much for finding time to talk to me. I'm really excited to, to hear the story of Exos and to deliver the message to our community. I'm really excited to, for us as Pressure Payload to work together with your company because the, the history of the company and your capabilities that they're bringing to market is just fascinating. And yeah, looking forward to hear more about the, the company. So yeah, maybe you could start with just telling first about the company, then a bit about, about the founding team, the origins of the, of the company. Well, Andre, great to be on today. Uh, thank you so much for the invite and the opportunity to work with Precious Payloads. It's been absolutely a godsend for us uh, being able to form out that side of the marketing and just the hundreds of connections that you've made through uh, the various channels, even through your YouTube. Just absolutely great content. We really appreciate that. So uh, the origins of the company, you know, it really started out of our mission. And we wanted to provide affordable and reliable space flight operations. And the way we're going to do that is with commercial aircraft and air-launched hydrogen-breathing rockets for what I call cost-conscious operations, right? We're going to focus on rapid development of products for our three prime markets, which are defense and hypersonics, national charters, which goes back to a long history of suborbital vehicles that are reusable, that we want to take that technology around the world because it's something that is realistic to take around the world just because it's not uh, quite as guarded as an orbital launch vehicle, right? And then ultimately, we want to serve commercial space objectives around the world. So there's the mission. But the vision really comes from the International Space Station the world work together to develop thousands. I think there's over 3000 experiments that were done on the International Space Station. And even say 10% of those were quote successes. The other 90% probably were because of what we learned, but we said, you know, maybe we can't do that in space. But if we just grab that, and I'm gonna distill it down to one really personal, um, thing for me. My dad suffered several strokes. And one of the experiments that was done by Dr. Abba Zubair on the International Space Station was flying stem cells. And they spent years and millions of dollars to put stem cells on the International Space Station. And what they found is that they could have stem cell activation and growth within a matter of a couple of weeks. And my dad is on the phase two clinical trials. The phase one mm -hmm. clinical trials went really, really well. And they found that Larry Harvey, Center for Applied Space Technology, one of his neighbors is actually out traveling the world and was even during COVID because he went through that treatment and he had had a stroke and was housebound prior. Mm -hmm. So imagine what we can do with a manufacturing capability on demand that we can just send to space and bring back three, four, six weeks later to bring products back and leverage space for mankind. So there's the passion. That's what drives me and gets me up every morning. Great. I'm glad to hear that we're on the same page here because I've often been asked like what I really expect the space industry to be in five years from now. And I'm always saying that I really hope that in five years from now, it would be normal for us to wear or use space manufactured products in our daily life, be it medicine, supplements, fiber optic cable, or, or anything else. So yeah, I'm really excited about that sort of version of the future. I'm really glad that you touched, touched on the same topic. Awesome. Uh, yeah, that, that's really, really great mission and vision. Uh, one thing that you mentioned in the beginning, the hydrogen powered air launch capability. Wow. I mean, look, the, the air launch itself is really complex, like the industry of itself, right? The, the hydrogen powered rockets is, is also, you know, a very, I would say niche, but also very complex part of the industry. How, how, how you even came with the idea to combine both and put the hydrogen fueled rocket on top of the airline, sorry, the, the aircraft, of course. Yeah. So, um, Hydrogen power, NASA picked it for a reason, right? 50 years ago, they picked it for a reason. Artemis 1, they picked it for a reason, right? 
it's because it's the world's lightest fuel. It is super efficient. However, we're leveraging a couple things. Obviously, we couldn't hang Artemis under a rocket or under an aircraft, right? <laughs> However, small launch can easily fit under a rocket or a, fit a rocket under a 777 aircraft, for example. And our model is that we will use that, and I'll call it stage zero of the aircraft mm -hmm. to give us the advantage where we don't have to have a Artemis one level hydrogen engine to get us to space. And that allows us super simplification. Uh, you know, we don't have to have hydrogen pumps. We don't have to have a megawatt of batteries uh, to get us to orbit because guess what? Hydrogen is boiling at 420 degrees, right? So it's self-pressurizing itself. So those are some mm -hmm. of the things um, that we put into that study to say, yes, hydrogen is going to be a great fuel for us. And obviously, we're going to lean on NASA for everything that we can. Uh, mm -hmm. We're not proud of saying we're creating things new. We're just putting things together in a different way, leveraging those NASA technologies where not millions, but billions were spent. And the decision was hydrogen. So following the, in those footsteps and mm -hmm. being a small scale vehicle, we can put things together in a different way that enable a totally new and simplify a form of launch. Great. And talk to me a bit about what Exus is today and what you are focusing now as on, you know, this year, the next year, because I understand that you you also found a pretty good market in the suborbital launches. So talk to me about what the company is today and what's going to happen in the company in the next 24 months. Yeah. So today um, we had a suborbital reusable launch vehicle and it puts us as one of three in the world or in the U.S. at least, that's licensed to fly a reusable vehicle and have actually done it, right? We flew mm -hmm. our SARS-1 vehicle four times. We know SpaceX has done that and Blue Origin has done that, right? Well, we're the only other one with a license. And Rocket Lab may be shifting that way because they realize that you can only big build factories so big and still be cost-effective, right? Mm -hmm. Suborbital, that vehicle was actually expanded quadrupled the capability under a Defense Department contract. And again, I mentioned in the beginning, we have three major markets, defense, national charter enterprises, where we take our technologies out to the world, and then commercial space. Well, mm -hmm. defense paid us on a phase one and then a phase two contract for the U.S. Air Force to develop the vehicle you see hovering in the picture behind mm -hmm. me to make it lighter, faster, more capable. So. This all stems from a very large biomedical company that came to me, and I used to work for the vice president of this biomed company. And she told me, she said, I don't need an orbital launch. Mm -hmm. I don't need orbital launch capability. She said, I need 50 flights in a year to be able to develop the technologies so that we'll know how to most effectively manufacture in space. She said, I don't care if it's two or three minutes a shot. Mm -hmm. Just get me into space to run our equipment and develop our, our space lab. Take this lab to space, put it there for four to six weeks, deorbit it, and our plan is a capsule, and bring it back with product. And she said, we can grow crystals at high growth percentages that will far, far outweigh building an Earth-based factory. She said, we can make the economics work, but first I need 50 flights, and then I'll tell you how long I need on that orbital flight with that capsule that you're going to mm -hmm. bring back in X number of weeks, and the sky's the limit for you when you do that. So that's the model we're following, and the suborbital isn't meant to uh, be just a suborbital research program, which mm -hmm. it does make a phenomenal research platform for the world uh, to actually put an experiment into space, test it, and prove it before you put it on an orbital launch and potentially add to the space junk situation we already have. Once again, you mentioned the, uh, the study that you tell was very, again, close to what we see in the market is that we do have a pain customer of ours that also um, work with pharmaceutical company to do the test pods 
in eventually in space, but we also figured out that the the best go to market strategy for them is to conduct the the research on the suborbital launches. Yes, because you know first it's if you consider the entire cost of building the orbital payloads, register like to register it, all the logistics around it, and then the orbital launch, the the cost of the cost of suborbital one is like a magnitude less than doing the orbital mission. And the, and, and the best about it is if you're lucky, they, you also get your payload back so you can reuse it, you can analyze, you can get more data out of it. And for the cost of one orbital launch, you can do five, seven, eight suborbital launches. What we started doing from there, from this sort of case study, we started going to our clients and saying, hey, we really think that despite the fact that big portion of business is getting orbital launch for our customers, we always say, hey, the best orbital mission is no mission. Because if you can achieve the same business goals, I'm not saying technological goals or TRL, right? I'm saying if the, the, the business goals or the, the investment goals can be achieved with a orbital launch, go for it. Like the best orbital mission is the one that never happens. <laughs> Absolutely. And to, you know, there are so many little details that we try and design for today. So imagine a 3U payload that we can put in space for $18,000. Do you want to risk a $1,000 payload on orbit and realize that there's a three cent capacitor on there that's not actually going to handle the vacuum? Or exactly. do you want to put it in space for 18 grand, bring it back and say, we either had success or we had a failure in that uh, two to three minutes of exposure to microgravity, the cold of space, the vacuum of space. Your TRL number just advanced exponentially because of the capability to actually put it in that space environment. And great wisdom there. And obviously some direction also that we've received from precious payloads on what the markets are saying. So uh, yeah, just great working with you guys. Of course, you know, we, we've mentioned the in-space manufacturing and also biomedical applications. What are the other potential applications that you see um, that are being made possible by the suborbital capabilities? Yeah, so obviously we've proven on the International Space Station, there are literally hundreds of things we can manufacture in space that we can't on the ground. Fiber optics is one of the great ones. Mm -hmm. um, we can actually uh, heal wafers as uh, one of our partner companies they do it on aircraft right now where they actually just do parabolas but that 20 seconds it takes like 20 or 30 parabolas with these wafers heated up and in microgravity all the little imperfections come out so you take a 200 dollars board that's now mm -hmm. worth you know 1500 2000 dollars because the microgravity environment has cured it under heat, mm -hmm. gotten rid of all the just doing a single rocket flight instead of those 22 parabolas mm -hmm. where you're flying to get a little bit of microgravity on each time, you're having to provide a huge amount of power just to heat it. So I just see hundreds of those experiments just coming to light because of this capability. Fascinating. Yeah, that's, that's a good story to tell as well. Great. And you also mentioned that you eventually want to bring both the suborbital and orbital capability abroad, so to international clients. Can you talk a bit about your plans? Where will you be licensed to operate the air launch service? And then what's the roadmap to that? Yeah. So early on, uh, we recognized the capability in Italy. And I'm half Italian. My grandfather... <laughs> was from Italy. He dove, uh, actually invented the underwater camera. So a little bit of this inventive, I've got to give my grandfather credit for. Mm -hmm. He dove with Jacques Cousteau in the shark tank and doing all that early underwater stuff that everyone's so familiar with. And uh, of course, he was from Italy. So we set up shop in Italy. We started working with the Italian national government. We actually are uh, in the university with Politecnico University in mm -hmm. Turin. And we're working with the Italian Air Force to set up our launch operations for ground launch um, from Sardinia. 
Mm-hmm. So there's a very well-known uh, launch platform off of right on the coast of Sardinia uh, that we intend to use. And that's our path forward. We'll do suborbital launches from European soil, from Italy, uh, which is really exciting because I think the last launch was over like 50 years ago, mm-hmm. uh, short of some defense things that uh, are classified. But mm-hmm. So we'll be back doing commercial launch from Italy with the suborbital vehicle. And then we'll use that as the launch pad for orbital capabilities, much Mm -hmm. like Virgin Orbit has uh, gone in and started down that path, but they've pulled back from Italy. Mm -hmm. So uh, we will continue that. We have Decima Manu Air Base also on Sardinia, where we could do the air launch from for our orbital platform. One of the things we found is uh, European companies like to deal with European companies and the huge advantage for us. If you look at some of the very large defense programs and you look at the capabilities of the machine shops there, I can't tell you how many first articles I saw, whether it's for space station or for defense contracts, where the first one they built was perfect. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about super, super complex machines. And, you know, I've been in Lockheed Martin's facilities and I've been in the Italian facilities and Mm -hmm. they're craftsmen. You know, it's a hundred years of Italian craftsmanship there. So um, that's one of the keys. So Exospace Italia is a totally Italian company. And fortunately, um, due to my past and my, I can actually get my citizenship and manage the company over there. So. Mm -hmm. I spend about a third of my time in Italy. So there's our entrance into at least the European markets. And then we've got another consortium cooking for us to uh, kind of work the Southern hemisphere uh, with potential for launch from Brazil. So uh, mm-hmm. yeah, that's great. Because, the world. Yeah, because you mentioned that the different, I named like pockets of the industry, they highly, highly pro- like protective about doing the business within like nation soil or within the soil of the European Union or South America or North America or the Asian market. So I think it's really important that you have the international base from the day one and eventually you'll be able to serve both the markets because it's, it would be extremely hard for a U.S. company to compete for the business in Europe, for example. And to talk, to talk a bit more about the competitive landscape. So by the time the Exos would be able to deliver the payloads to orbit, of course, we, we both know that the market will be really crowded by then. So what do you think is special about your business model and capabilities that should win you the business regardless of the competitors coming online in the time frame that you imagine? Yeah, so one of the key things is Exos will actually go through what we call a wet lease model. And Mm -hmm. I believe that's going to allow us to work with the U.S. State Department to go anywhere in the world. And that model is based on not transferring ownership of the vehicle, but Exos would Mm -hmm. actually. So we fly under our U.S. launch license. Um, I think that's one of the keys Mm -hmm. uh, to it. But the other thing is, air launch, right? So we're not launching over soil. We're launching over 70% of the earth over the oceans. Gets Mm -hmm. us away from the challenges of um, high occupancy, right? Uh, Even as we look at Dubai and Saudi Arabia for potential ground launch, it's really hard to find the space and the infrastructure at the same time. Well, Mm -hmm. air launch solves that as well. So, Um, As we go out into the world, um, it brings up a challenge as well. And the challenge is going to be, we're not going to go to a launch. We're going to do a launch campaign. Mm -hmm. The reason we're going to do that is we're going to launch from under a 777. That 777 for the last three months has been flying from the U.S. to Saudi Arabia, to Dubai, to Brazil, to Italy, carrying commercial cargo. and then. We're going to pull it off a commercial cargo service and we're going to take the fairings off of our rocket release and tow hook. I'll Mm -hmm. give you a little clue there on the tow hook for later, but 
Um, we'll pull that off and then we're going to do a launch campaign and we're not going to launch a rocket. That vehicle has come out of commercial service. It's going to go into rocket service for the next several weeks. And we're going to do mm -hmm. three, four, five, six launches ultimately um, in that, you know, several week period. So mm -hmm. that if we do have a customer that delays, we're not faced with the same type of crippling launch costs that we get <laughs> on a commercial range where we're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars a day for delays. Uh, we might just fly to another airport that's three mm -hmm. or four hours away, launch the next day from that next airport so we can still hit a launch trajectory that we might have had to wait a month to get again at that mm -hmm. ground launch location. And of course, you know, that means infrastructure has to be very mobile. Guess what? Yeah. Hydrogen is pretty readily available anywhere in the world. It's not one of those big challenges. Again, going back to, you know, why that hydrogen vehicle? You can find hydrogen just about anywhere. So. Right. Very interesting because I think it's, it's once again, it hits one of the stories I like to tell that the, the cost of launch service per se, like that price stack that the CubeSat developers get, is just the tip of the iceberg. Because what you mentioned brings me down to the idea of cost of mobilization, like what you need to do in order to actually make the launch happen. And especially in the situation where you have multiple payloads coming to the same um, launch vehicle, the hardest part I know about all these ride share aggregators and special launch operator is how to make sure that everyone arrives at one place within a couple of days, all fully tested, all fully registered and compliant, all the paperwork done perfectly and it go like, you know, and all the like little things like securing the visas for engineers from around the world to get to that what country, for example, the United States, uh, and then to arrive on time for the launch campaign and the final integration, it's very hard. And it's probably the hardest part beyond just building a rocket. That's the, the hardest operational, operational, was a challenge that all these launch operators are facing now and going to face in the future as well. So what, what I read from your study is that if you're able to pull this off where you do have the license to launch from multiple airports, again, we're not talking, you know, launch pad like Vanderberg or the, uh, the, the Florida one, the Canada Space Center. Yeah, if, if we are talking about multiple airports or air launch facilities, and then you can yeah, stack multiple rockets per launch campaign and then provide that kind of flexibility. I think that really gives a different story about the costs and also about the way the potential customers are thinking about the flexibility around the, the launch, the launch capabilities. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously if, you know, we start with uh, scheduling three launches and we do have a primary satellite customer, right? We've got $420 million in satellite launches. It's a total of 51 launches with our MOU customer. And again, satellite launch is the primary, but they're one. And we anticipate having three, four. But the first campaign is actually, we want to do three launches on that first campaign. And even if one of them pulls out, it's negligible effect on mm -hmm. the other two, right? So when you get to... My target is six. When you get to doing six launches at a time, even if you have 50% of them show up, the economic model goes back to our mission that we need cost conscious space operations. Just like Walmart, you know, looks at the demographics of a community before they put a Walmart there. Right. We're looking at the space demographic kind of in that same way that we recognize we cannot afford to mobilize an aircraft and in this case, it's pretty good because uh, we can say, oh, we need to go to uh, Brazil this week and we're going to launch from Alcantara in Brazil. Let's pick up payload to go there, right? So the flight yeah. is already covered. Now we just need to make that little hop over from wherever we landed over to the 8,000 foot runway, which there are thousands of them in the world. Yep. We can launch from there because we've got the infrastructure that came in in containers and is sitting there waiting for us. So again, just we believe it's game changing, and for us, yeah, it hits that 
cost conscious space operations model. True. It's funny that you mentioned Walmart. I was recently reading the uh, the book about the history about the company, and I was fascinated to learn that back in the 80s, they invested in their own satellites to provide the connectivity between different headquarters within the country. It's just <laughs> 80s. And, and isn't that yeah, amazing? It's, yes, it's amazing. And I just want to wish all of us that, and really that's, that's my like largest belief about the, the future of the space industry, that I wish that more and more non-space companies, like biomedical companies or retail companies or car manufacturers or companies like Apple would start recognizing that all the infrastructure that this space nerds and, and the space industry companies built is actually available for them to improve the service and the products that they have for everyday people here on Earth. And so space is not for crazy people who want to go to Mars. It's, it's about improving the life here on Earth and improving the service and products that we use here every day and also, you know, hopefully helping the people um, with um, treating diseases and, you know, just, just making better life here on planet. Yeah. Yeah. So I never want to solve a problem as uh, I used to say in my submarine days, I don't want to boil the ocean. You know, that, that would be a hard <laughs> problem, right? But providing food for the world. Right. I mean, we all know I don't think we go anywhere. I don't go anywhere in a city without my GPS telling me if there's been right. an accident. Right. And of course, that comes from the space program and diabetes. The treatments that we have today were from the space mm -hmm. program. And, you know, um, even LASIK surgery and things like that all came yes. out of needs from the space program because we saw degeneration in our uh, spacefaring folks eyesight. So, so many of those things already benefit us. I believe that we actually cure the world's or challenges that farmers have with being able to grow crops and sustain the growth that we've got in the world right now because we can understand the conditions in any given environment from space. It's just on an exponential move up with as the capability of these small sats uh, give us greater and greater options that we never mm -hmm. had before that's right john great john last but not least what's the next milestone for the company that people need to be excited about and then when to expect that yeah so we're in in process of the one of the milestones uh we've got a private offering that we're uh extending a little bit because uh mm -hmm. closing our series a round has taken a little longer than we expected but Typical compliance things that people are dotting their I's and crossing their T's, and that's great. And that will launch our Altos program, which is Air Launch to Orbit System under the Metro mm -hmm. 7 aircraft and hiring. You know, again, we go down to some of the challenges. Uh, Artemis has challenges with hydrogen fuel leaks, even, right? And uh, NASA yeah. has recently started a new program uh, with one of well, several universities to solve those problems. And as we move forward, that and hiring the staff level that we need to do the Altos program, uh, I think it comes at a really good time, although somewhat unfortunate that uh, Lockheed Martin uh, and the X-68 program was mm -hmm. ended and another competitor got it, but I think it'll make us all better because of it. And our evolution into also the hypersonic as we move forward using all the same technologies that we're using on our orbital launcher uh, will mm -hmm. kind of propel us forward. So yeah, resources. So those of you who are uh, space geek enough to be listening to this or to wear a shirt with astronauts on it, <laughs> planets, get ready. Uh, we'll be looking for you. <laughs> Great. Thanks, John. Thanks for the message. Um, we'll definitely put it out to the world. And thank you so much for your time. It's been exciting to learn more about the company and the origin of it and really about your vision and the founding story of the company. Thank you so much. Thank you very much as well. Look forward to working with you more and at Astra.